And tonight, um, we have Dr. Margaret Mulholland. And as you can see, she is Professor Ocean, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences, and her PhD is in Biological Oceanography. What I'll talk about today is going to move you much further south into the Chesapeake Bay. We're sort of a model here for um, things to come in a lot of places in the country. We're just at sort of the ground zero of sea level rise. And we now experience uh, coastal flooding when the sky is blue. And this is actually one of my graduate students standing here in the uh, foreground there. And one of the groups that are very interested in what we're doing and fund us is actually our public utility, the Hampton Road San Sanitation District, um, a very progressive public utility that's very interested in water quality issues. OK, so everyone knows sea level is rising, I hope. This is an old report, actually, from 2000, what is this one, uh, 2007. The IPCC report, they're a very conservative scientific body that try to provide conservative estimates. So when they made an estimate in 2007, they suggested that sea level in the year 2100 would have risen by about 0.6 to 1.9 feet, despite the fact that there were other studies at the time saying it was likely to rise even faster by that time. Well, they just released another IPCC report in 2014. They're doing regular updates. And in fact, that estimate of, from the IPCC did rise. Actually, all this data is from proxy data, tide gauge data. And then from the year, what is that, about 2010 on, it's models. And different models have different predictions. But the trajectory is always the same. <laughs> the cone just varies. and the rate at which the rise happens uh, changes. And if you look at the 2007 IPCC report and put that in there, you'll see that it's a little wedge below that. So they've even revised their estimates up into how fast sea level is rising. This is a big concern in places like Norfolk, Virginia, because our average elevation is seven feet above sea level. So that can be a big problem. Um, the reason we're this rate is increasing is, you, you all may have seen this curve, the Mauna Loa curve uh, measuring PCO2. You see the ups and downs every year as the planet breathes because the, the institute is in the northern hemisphere. And you can see that uh, the increase in PCO2 in the atmosphere has increased over time. Actually, you can look at their website, which is there, and will be available. And when I looked it up yesterday, we're at 413.92 ppm. And we're increasing at a rate of 3 ppm per year, which means that we'll be at least 249 ppm higher by the year 2100, or at about 649 parts per million of PCO2 in the atmosphere. And that puts us in the higher ranges of uh, sea level rise. So sea level rise is just a background thing. Sea level is rising. Uh, and so in places like Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia. This is a, a figure drawn by one of my colleagues at, at Old Dominion. And this is a frequency plot of hours spent one foot above mean high, high water um, per year between June and November. And you can see from the year 1900 to the last estimate was in this plot goes up to 2016. These hours spent among uh, far above mean high, high water have greatly increased. And if you look at the Union of uh, Concerned Scientists publication over here, you can see Norfolk, Virginia. This is a plot just showing the current number of flooding events per year. There's Norfolk, Virginia. The projected uh, number of events by year 2030 is in the medium shade of blue. And the events per year projected for year 2145 is that big one. And Norfolk, Virginia is sort of in the middle of this list. Maine only has one city here, Portland. <laughs> but it's still in trouble a little bit. But if you go up and look here, places like Washington, DC, they're in deep doo-doo. Is the flooding projected for cities like that it will increase greatly in the future. And normally, we can actually superimpose storms on this figure. And there's a lot of storms there. And sure, we get a lot of flooding during the different storms that have been named. Here's Hurricane uh, Sandy here 
in, I forget what year that was, 20, 2012, I put it there so I wouldn't forget because I always forget. And, um, and you can see a number of other different named storms and sure, there was a lot of flooding during those. Okay, so we expect this flooding when it's stormy. This is actually a street in Norfolk during, uh, I think it was Matthew in 2015. And you can see the car is stuck there. And here we can see the flooding is reaching to the foot of houses. And actually I'll talk about this a little more later, but the Federal Emergency Management Agency was actually raising houses because they were flooding so often. They've since stopped that program of spending our money in this way. Actually, they found out that it would take them 300 years to raise the houses that were currently on the list to be raised in Norfolk alone. So it didn't seem worth it. Um, storm surge looks like this. In Norfolk, Virginia, you see the tides come in down here. It's coming up the street, and then it goes back out. That was a friend of ours put a GoPro <laughs> on their, um, the, the eaves on their porch, front porch. They lived in that house and they always are flooding so they get worried about it. And when it floods, it's really inconvenient. Here's cars still going through it. And that's my son. <laughs> and here's a car stuck in it. And you can see all these cars just stuck in the streets. It affects our everyday life. We lose property. Actually, one of my graduate students that was from the local area at the time, she said people that live in one neighborhood go park their car that they want to get rid of in the flood zone when they know it's going to flood. <laughs> then they can get the insurance claim. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be telling you those secrets. <laughs> but people leave their vehicles out and they get flooded or they're away. There's a storm, it floods, they lose their property. Um, it's also hard to sell houses. <laughs> when the water's coming into them. Here's for sale signs. This is a neighbor, neighborhood called The Hague in Norfolk uh, that routinely floods. And this is another neighborhood where they're raising houses that routinely floods. And they're trying to sell houses and they've been on the market a while. <laughs> you always want to actually make sure you do your house buying tour when it's uh, spring tide in, <laughs> in Norfolk. Um, but we also have a little fun and I'm going to hope that I can convince you not to do this, but the kids go jumping around and playing on boogie boards in them. People kayak down the streets, and here's a family getting into their kayak to leave their house and to get out, and here's someone even swimming in the water. Big ick. Okay, um, but on land we're adapting. We've put up signs. We have no wake zones on our streets. <laughs> We have parking lots with signs that say park at your own risk. We have meter sticks that we put by the side of the roads so you can see how deep the water is so you can decide if you want to go through it or not because it's salty water. It's really hard on cars. And here's um, in this church parking lot, it's actually being turned into a school now, there's a warning about uh, checking the tides before you park there <laughs> for services. We keep the tides on our... Um, our website there. Vegetation is responding. We're having a lot of the saltwater intrusion that's affecting the plant life that doesn't like it. And then this, I love this picture because it's an algal mat growing on someone's front yard that routinely floods. And we're trying to protect our infrastructure and we're building structures to try to build them. We've talked with the Dutch uh, about building walls around the city. We have floodgates that now we're testing much more routinely because we're also a place that has a lot of tunnels. We don't have bridges in a lot of places because we have such a heavy military presence, so they don't want to block military ships from coming in and out of Hampton Roads. So we tunnel under our rivers. Um, but this is houses that we're paying for to go up on stilts, and they park up in their driveway when they know it's going to flood, or up in their lawn when they know it's going to flood. Um, but now, like I said, we can't anymore because this is becoming so regular. So they've discontinued the raising of houses. They're trying to uh, generate buyback programs so that uh, people can be reimbursed for their loss of property. And they're trying some novel solutions to try to um, uh, reimburse people. And like I said, we're even flooding when the skies are blue. This is just because of the tides. This is just a high tide. And this is someone's street. There's someone's front 
stoop going up the steps. Uh, another street here, impassable. Uh, this is a parking lot that routinely floods and people have left their car there when it's just a high tide. And you know, this is just some more pictures to uh, demonstrate all these different areas. And we know these regular areas flood and under blue skies. And like I said, um, it, it, part of this is because sea level is also rising. In Norfolk, we are rising at a higher rate than the national average. Our sea level is rising at a higher rate. Um, so, uh, so here's our local tide gauge data in Norfolk starting in about 1930. And here is the global tide gauge data. And actually now we also measure uh, sea level height by satellites, believe it or not. And so, um, but we're rising at a rate that's about twice as high as other places. Why is that? We're also sinking. <laughs> about half of our relative sea level rise is due to the seas rising. The other half is due to the fact that our land is subsiding. And um, this is just a picture showing uh, the East Coast, um, the estimated glacial rebound rates. You may have heard when the glaciers come, they weigh down the land. And when the glaciers go away, the land springs back a little bit. So it rises. Um, so what, what does a glacier have to do with the fact that this area is sinking? Well, when you push something down on the land, there's a little floor bulge at the front of the glacier that pops up. And so we're popping, we're sinking a little because that weight was removed and we were on that four bulge, so we're sinking. Uh, we're going back down. You guys are in luck because uh, Maine is rising a little bit. <laughs> so it's lucky. Actually, on Long Island Sound, uh, if you ever have gone on Long Island, I used to live there, and you'll see the North Shore Long Island eroding, and that's because Connecticut is rising faster than Long Island, so Long Island Sound is tipping over. Same with the Great Lakes. <laughs> so you get erosion there because of that. Um, this is just a, a figure showing some relative rates of sea level uh, rise in different areas. And you can see Galveston, Galveston, Texas has a really high rate, and a lot of that has to do with extraction of oils as well. Uh, New York City has a high relative sea level rise rate. Norfolk isn't on here. Baltimore as well. Sitka, Alaska is somewhere that's safe <laughs> because they're actually rising. The land is rising faster than the water is. Okay, so, so we usually talk about in the business, we talk about relative sea level rise because that's what sea level is doing relative to land. And we know that in Norfolk, Virginia, about 10 inches, it, it's about really half and half um, of our sea level rise is due to uh, actual eustatic sea level rise or glacial melting, glaciers melting. And the other half is due to our land is sinking. And that's due to the isostatic rebound, like I said, from the glaciers, but also groundwater withdrawal. There is a, a town further inland from us that has actually sunk 70 meters. There's a paper mill there, and it's all due to groundwater withdrawal in that area. And um, yeah. And there's also, in Chesapeake Bay, and this caused a little bit of the subsidence, is there's an, a meteor crater there. And it's actually fractured a lot of the uh, drinking water reservoirs there. OK. So we've been here before. <laughs> we've had estimated shoreline from 125,000 years ago during the big melt was here, where the green meets the orange. So all this area was underwater before, quite some time ago. And, um, but about 20,000 years ago, the shoreline was almost out to the continental shelf break. And actually, you can sometimes on the, on the islands out here, they'll sometimes get big tufts of grass and buffalo skeletons will wash up on some of the barrier islands there um, because uh, buffalo used to graze out there. <laughs> or maybe it's bison, I always forget which. Um, but we know this because of a combination of sediment dating, location of marine and terrestrial fossils, sedimentary structures, and um, other things. And this is a picture showing the last big chill when the glaciers were two miles thick over New York City. Sea level was substantially lower at that time. And we were our 
our um, shoreline was near the continental end, edge of the continental shelf versus during the last big melt up here, way back 125,000 years ago. Uh, the position of sea level was higher than it is now. And we know all this area was underwater. So the people from the eastern shore, you were underwater too, just like us. And you could extend this map. And if you look at Florida, it was about half the size it is now uh, because it's very low lying and a lot of the Gulf Coast as well. The problem is now we have huge amounts of resources and infrastructure on the land in these areas. Um, we call this the Suffolk Scarp near where we are. We think that was the edge of sea level. But now we have 1.6 million people just in the Hampton Road region here, east of that Suffolk Scarp. And we have the 10th most valuable assets at risk from sea level rise in the world in Norfolk, Virginia. And a lot of that has to do with we're the home of the Atlantic fleet there. And we have a humongous coal terminal there. Norfolk Southern Railroad is based in Norfolk, Virginia. And they transport coal, at least for now. OK, so when are we most at risk of flooding? I said we, there are regular times. Well, during storms, of course. Also during spring tides. And I'm going to remind you of what those are. <laughs> And during perigean spring tides, we are especially vulnerable. And when winds blow from the northeast, which happens a lot in the winter when we get nor'easters, right? And I'm going to tell you just a little bit. This is the classroom stuff about how tides work. In, there's whole lectures on this and whole classes on this. So I'm going to do it in two slides. <laughs> but there's actually a solar and a lunar component to the moon. The solar component is a year, a cycle around uh, the sun versus the um, Earth-Moon system is also rotating at a period of about 28 days, so the solar tidal. If you were to just look at these two components of tides, there are many, 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 many more that I'm not going to talk about. If you add them up, it means that we tend to, at our latitude all along the east coast of the U.S., we get semi-diurnal tides, and they change over the course of the month. And so a lot of students come in and think, oh, we get spring tides in the spring. That's not so. <laughs> we get spring tides every month when the earth, moon, and sun are aligned in a line like this. <laughs> so you get spring tides at the new and full moon. You get neap tides that are, are less strong when the moons are at the quarter. Because here, the gravitational forces are smaller because the earth, moon, sun are not in a line. <laughs> so they don't add up anymore. And I had to put one equation because I couldn't help myself. But, but if you want to understand the tidal forces, the tides also change over the course of months because the Earth, the orbits of the moon around the, the Earth and the Earth around the sun are not circular. They're elliptical. So sometimes the Earth, the um, moon and Earth are closer to each other in this ellipse. That's the perigee. And when they're furthest away, that's the apogee. So when I talk about a perigee in spring tide then, that's when the moon is closest to the sun. And all this tide generating force says is that the tide generation, generating force is proportional to that distance between the Earth and moon and the Earth-moon system and the sun. OK? So um, yeah, so there are both. Uh, Solar and lunar components, they both contribute to our tides. This is a nice, much more friendly NOAA figure, <laughs> essentially telling you what a perigee in spring tide is. And it just occurs when the moon is either new or full. And so when, um, yeah, so, so during a new moon and full moon, you can get a perigee in spring tide when they're close. Yeah. Hopefully that made sense. OK, winds. <laughs> this is a really complicated slide. But it's when I look at, I look at this tide charts every single day from NOAA, because this is how we plan when we sample, <laughs> is what we have here. These are two um, examples of water height versus predicted tide, is all these are. In this blue line is the predicted tides, based on astronomical and all the other forces. Then there's a. Uh, observation of what was measured in red. And then there's total water guidance in black. 
and that's the actual total water they expect. So this includes weather. And this is a period, this is, in case you can't see it, this goes up to five feet above um, the mean water level, mean sea level. So five feet is a lot in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> it means we're going to get a lot of flooding. And so this water guidance happened during a spring tide with strong northeasterly winds, and there was no rain. And we had five feet of flooding. And that was just winds. In this one, there was an extra tropical frontal storm. And so some of this water guidance was due to storm surge pushing up the bay. And so, but again, over five feet higher than normal tide in that. And so, so weather is also really important. And one of the reasons why, and you may have look, learned about Mr. Coriolis way back, right? The Coriolis force, anyone heard of that? That causes a deflection in the northern hemisphere, what? To the right of anything that's not solid. So air and water. So when we get winds out of the northeast, coming down the coast, wind and water are deflected to the right. Guess what that does? The Chesapeake Bay mouth is oriented north-south. So when we get winds from the northeast, it shoves water right through that bay mouth and right onto our land. <laughs> so that's why the weather matters. Um, uh, the Coriolis effect is that white word the rightward deflection. And Ekman transport is just the deflection of the water by the wind. <laughs> so the wind's deflected, then the water's deflected. And so that uh, northeast winds do a number on the Chesapeake Bay, especially when we're at a perigee in spring tide anyway. <laughs> OK? Actually, when we get winds out of the southeast, we can have lower than normal tides. But winds out of the northeast are a very common weather pattern in the winter and in the spring, in the fall, rather. So back to flooding. You guys have probably been thinking about the landward part of all these resources at risk, right? Well, a lot of people have been thinking about that. <laughs> and so I want to think about, I started thinking about the water side <laughs> of things. Because when water comes onto the landscape, five feet of it, <laughs> it pulls everything from the landscape back into the water when it goes back, right? And that's not included in any of our restoration plans, the effects of flooding. So those, no, anything that goes in the water as the, the tides recede is not counted and not planned for. And we have drains. They're marked with these, no dumping, because they go to the Chesapeake Bay. And they're on the drains. But our problem is when it floods, we don't like drains. Drains are not our friend. The water comes up through the drains and onto the streets. And then they go back out the drains. So, so it's a little bit of a different situation. Is usually we think of drains as a one-way trip down. But that not so in Norfolk. So, so the, as the water rises and falls with each tide, is things go back into the water. So now I want to show you some different pictures of flooding. And here you can just see the sheen from the oil there. And this is an overview of a massive flooding event. You can see all the oil and hydrocarbons going into the water. This is a, a video showing the water going and everything it's carrying going back down a drain. <laughs> Not all that surprising, but we're going to get to some grosser images now. Oh. Uh, there's litter <laughs> that gets swept away. There's some bubbling mass of gunk here <laughs> that's frightening to think about going back into the water. There are trash cans <laughs> being inundated, and so their entire contents are going in. Here's a nice little trash bag that's already in there. They're going in the water. And yep, we're going to go here too. There's my dog. <laughs> he was set up for the, she set up for the photo shoot really nicely. Uh, but this wasn't taken. I didn't leave it there. <laughs> but there is all sorts of pet waste, anything that's on the landscape goes in. This is actually water coming out of that drain. And that has toilet paper in it. One of my graduate students took that in front of their house. So there's a lot of ick. And so now I'm going to really switch gears. <laughs> and in the lower Chesapeake Bay, we have a huge problem with harmful algal blooms. Okay? And we noticed, as we've been sampling them over the years, that when I see a flooding event or a storm event, 
usually if it's summer, I'll call one of my graduate students and say, get ready to go sampling in three days. There's going to be a bloom of something. And it's, we think, because of these huge load of literally crap <laughs> that goes into the water uh, when um, the tides recede. And these make the front pages of our newspapers because sometimes they have bioluminescence and light up. And so they're a very big curiosity. Um, and so again, like flooding, blooms are a big deal in our area. And these are some pictures of some spectacular blooms that happen right adjacent to our campus. And we actually keep monitoring equipment on this dock here to um, observe them. And we're trying to develop predictive models to predict them. But over time, despite all the restoration efforts in the Chesapeake Bay, these are instances of blooms recorded from 1994 to 2006. And now 2007 to 2014, the incidence of blooms has really increased in the Chesapeake Bay. So this is of major concern. And so, oh, in a nutshell, this, these just show all the different uh, inputs into the Chesapeake Bay. There's atmospheric deposition of nutrients, land runoff, waste discharge, river inputs. And all these nutrients go into the bay, feed the algae, and the algae bloom, right? Well, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have been under a restoration effort since 1985, when the first Chesapeake Bay Agreement was signed. And they knew it was nutrients. <laughs> But this was a completely voluntary restoration between uh, 1985 and 2010. But a canoe club in Virginia had sued the federal government. And so in 2010, the restoration was deemed a failure. And now we're under federal mandate. The EPA stepped in and is setting loading requirements for the entire Chesapeake Bay, segment by segment. And what they do is they set total maximum daily loads of nitrogen for the different river systems segment by segment in the river. And it's the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus that can be put into the river for it to be maintained at a healthy level. What do I mean by that? Um, the standard is 15 micrograms of chlorophyll okay, per liter that is deemed healthy. This is what the water looks like when there's 21 micrograms of chlorophyll in it, so of plants. Chlorophyll is just a proxy for plants. So this is sort of barely acceptable. And this is 530 micrograms of chlorophyll. That's a lot of chlorophyll. And that is completely unacceptable, as is this. But when we have blooms, we hover in this range. That's a huge problem because this blocks light to underwater grasses. Many of the algae species make toxins that kill fish. And when they die and sink to the bottom, they decay and they consume all the oxygen. So we get, we get dead zones and we'll have crab jubilees. And trust me, that's no party. <laughs> that's when the crabs actually leave the water because there's no oxygen for them to breathe. <laughs> so it's no party. <laughs> so, so we have all these water quality problems and unlike other places, the Chesapeake Bay is uh, establishing total, total maximum daily loads for tributary by tributary. They are revisiting these loads and um, revising them over time. However, they don't include this, the flooding events. Okay, That's not included in the nutrient load. How these are calculated is I actually put a table in here, and this is the river, the estuary system we work in. It's a subtributary of the southern Chesapeake Bay, and they establish a total nitrogen load from wastewater treatment plants that can come in. Then they establish a load that can be from runoff, and then they can establish a, they establish a load that's due to atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. So all these different things, and then they add them all up, and that's your nitrogen load. And they do that segment by segment based on the science for the entire Chesapeake Bay. But there is no allocation for tidal flooding at all. So how can we quantify this? Well, we need it to flood. We need to sample as floodwaters recede. We need to sample multiple sites at the same time. And no one's done it because it would take an army. And this is our Army's leader. This is Alfonso Macias Tapia. He's one of my graduate students. And this will be part of his dissertation, actually. 
he's, he's not sampling for this project here. He's out at sea. But so we were able to leverage some other events happening in Norfolk. Actually, my husband, full disclosure, runs a nonprofit group where coastal adaptation is their main goal and sea level rise. His organization developed a phone application that's been applied nationwide. Has anyone ever seen it? By any chance, it's called a sea level rise app application, and you get it on your phone. And when it floods, you can walk around at the water level and drop a pin. And it will take a GPS coordinate of exactly where you are. And this data gets fed into a data assimilation model that's being run at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and um, for them to make better flood maps. So we have all this flooding in Norfolk. People wanted to build a public awareness and an engagement in what was happening. So our local media outlets decided that at our perigean spring tide, when the highest tide of the year is predicted, they would have a citizen science project, and they called that Capture the King Tide, because that perigean high tide, the highest tide of the year, is called the King Tide. So they tapped into this, and there was so much enthusiasm, there was about 1,000 people that went out mapping for this project. And so they were already collecting all this data on water level and where it was, and it was being fed into the model, like I said, at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So what we did is we decided we needed a catchy phrase, and my initials are MM. So, so we engaged students of all ages to go out and measure the muck when they were also doing the mapping. And so we trained them to collect water samples while they made the maps. This is what the finished maps look like of all those little pins being dropped in a neighborhood. So that was someone walking the water line and dropping pins every five or six steps. And this is just a log sheet of what we had our students do. We had them do a hard copy along with making these maps that had the GPS coordinates. And you can take a picture as well as make a note in the phone application when you collected a sample. So we had a lot of redundant um, information here. Uh, these are the two perigean spring tides. So this is just the tidal prediction, not including any weather. We, were gonna, we knew we were going to get a high tide, and it was going to be about five feet above normal when it was the king tide. Okay? This is the one we did in 2017, and this is in 2018. It wasn't the highest it could have been, but we can never predict the weather at the particular time. So, so what we did is we, at our lab at ODU, we uh, first trained people to use the mapping application. Then we supplied people with sampling kits because quality control was a big deal. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible. We just gave them sample bottles to collect gloves because we didn't want them to get icky water on their hands. And then they brought them back to our lab at ODU, and we had graduate students standing by to intake them and process them all. It took them about another 24 hours to do that. And these are some of the people sampling. And we actually also took samples in addition for the nitrogen compounds. We sampled uh, Enterococcus as well, uh, not as many times. But these are um, one of the mapping tracks that our students made. This is uh, some of them sampling the water there with their nice gloves on. And this is dropping a GPS point independently in another phone application so we know exactly where they were and, and they took a picture of her. So there would be, we would put out teams of four. So we'd have younger people paired with um, graduate students or professors so that they had some near peer mentoring along the way, which was really fun. They love hanging out with the graduate students much be better than they do with me. But this is uh, people walking around doing their sampling and filling out their log sheets, their manual ones, even though we knew we were going to get an electronic one, is sometimes people forgot <laughs> to do the electronic note. So we had manual backups. And this is just more pictures of people out collecting the samples in the floodwaters around town. And this is just during that predicted high tide in Norfolk. And so using all the data collected as part of the king tide mapping, our colleague at VIMS, Derek Loftus, he was able to calculate for us the total volume of flood water. He did that because he had all those data points. And then we just recently had LIDAR flown there. So we have very good land service elevation maps for our area. So he could correct those for the, um, with the LIDAR data for the land elevation, and this allowed him to know the volume of the floodwaters 
keep in mind, we got about 200 samples. There were many, 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 many more samples of the sea level application. So we had very good data on the water volume. Okay, and then we could make products like this in Google Earth where it may be hard to see some of these green pins, but this gives a relative magnitude of nitrogen in samples collected in different areas that we sampled in. And we can have scales, and this is a Google Earth product, but he also has generated some um, ArcGIS products as well. And I just wanted to show you this as an example, and we can superimpose this on where the flood happened in the area. And we also did other estimates where we could actually contour our nutrient concentration data so we could interpolate and calculate our uh, nitrogen loading in that way as well. But in the end, what we did was we decided to take a conservative approach because we don't want to overestimate how much nitrogen was being put in and alarm people. And so what we did is we took our median concentration of the dissolved nitrogen, because again, that's a conservative, gets rid of the outliers. Um, and we could calculate the nitrogen in flood water, really simple, <laughs> just by knowing that volume of water that was so important to calculate, knowing the amount of, in this case, ammonium that was dissolved in the water, and subtracting out what was on the, already in the river when it encroached upon the land. We have to take that out. And so we calculated a load for ammonium, really simply in this way, to be about 185 pounds. There are a lot of dissolved nitrogen compounds, and we are, I'm only going to show you the ammonium and the nitrate because we did the same thing for nitrate, a very common dissolved nitrogen compound that's used as a plant nutrient, right? And people fertilize with it. And in this case, we made the same sort of calculation, and we calculate we calculate about 1,600 pounds of nitrogen delivered as nitrate, and when we add that to ammonia, that was about 1,786 pounds of nitrogen delivered during the single flooding event for which there was no rain. <laughs> and if we go back and compare it to this TMDL that was established, this was in the Lafayette River. We only did it for this one tidal tributary because we wanted to do it right. So we wanted to focus all our samples and get good coverage. But the TMDL for overland flow for the year is 1,941 pounds of nitrogen. So we pretty much delivered the entire annual load of nitrogen during a single flooding event, but it's not being counted. It's not being counted in the, re the restoration. We're trying to restore the bay, but how do we hope to restore it if we're not counting such a big load? And this is happening a few times a month. So the other little icky part I wanted to add, because I found out you all were measuring enterococcus here, <laughs> is we had... The, our public utility, as well as our Department of Health, each analyzed 20 samples. These were a little trickier because you have to start them really fast after you collect the samples, so they could only handle so many. And so they looked at enterococcus in the waterways, and these colored dots may not mean anything to you, but our swimmable standard is 106, and it's a funny unit. Just think of it as 106. It's most probable units. It's, they plate these out and grow the bacteria. <laughs> and so it's a funny unit. So don't worry about that. But the, this is 106 most probable units, and we had only three samples, luckily they were at this yacht club where a lot of people swim, <laughs> that met the swimmable standard after the flooding, and, uh, or during the flooding. And seven of our samples were way above the maximum detection, over 24,000. It just pegs out, so we don't really know beyond that. But most of them, we can scale them here, between 1,000 and 10,000 and greater than 10,000 are the orange and red. And they're dominating the area. So you know what? You want to have fun? Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. And don't wait for someone to close the beach. If it's flooded, don't wait for it. It's going to be icky. <laughs> so don't do it, <laughs> even if you're tempted. So now what? else have we been doing? Well, we know not all flooding is equal, right? Because if it hasn't rained, if there's a protracted drought per period, there may be a lot of junk accumulated on the landscape, right? And if it's already just been washed by rainfall the previous day, there may be less junk. So what we've done is we've predicted, we've um, started sampling 
about 11 sites almost every time it floods. <laughs> and so these we're calling our sentinel sites because they're going to give us an idea of the variability between the flooding. So we can make, be a better predictor of, OK, if it's rained in the last couple of days, it's not going to be, the load won't be so high as if it hasn't. Or in the spring, when the pollen is all dropping, <laughs> the load might be more than it is another time of year. So, so we'll be able to account for some of this variability. We also want to account for the different land uses that happen because you know, paved areas are conduits for water to go back in uh, to, the, to the river, whereas lawns may have different issues because in one of these areas that flooded here, there was a freakishly green yard, <laughs> okay? So there's a lot of fertilizer <laughs> that's supporting that freakishly green yard. <laughs> So we know that you know, some of our spaces are going to have different types of loads, depending on what's been on the landscape. And so what's next? Um, we know that climate change and this recurrent flooding um, will jeopardize coastal restoration efforts. And so we need to adapt these efforts to restore. And right now, we, the Chesapeake Bay program, I've been an advisor to the Chesapeake Bay program for some time. I'm no longer on that committee but have been participating in a lot of workshops to try to figure out how to include these types of loads in the models of nutrient loading to the bay. Because we can't hope to restore the bay if we're not counting <laughs> some of what's going in. OK, and with that, I'll thank you all for coming. And this is a picture of a boom. <laughs> so.